so Su Suzanne Pierce um, is a research scientist at the University of Texas um, and works at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, she really embraces the challenge of uh, integrated modeling um, and uses models as well as participatory uh, processes for uh, uh, modeling decision support things, um, which seems like a very complex thing to do um, and pulls in a lot of experts and like, just from uh, seeing her connections and her projects uh, you can see that it's like usually a, like really large teams or very interdisciplinary groups. Um, Suzanne will talk to us today about decision support systems in the wicked <laughs> and wild world. <laughs> Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, oh. we can. Oh good, okay great. Thank you so much for the introduction and yeah um, the title shifted a bit for my presentation today, and I'll start by just explaining um, why I chose this particular uh, title. Uh, DSS stands for Decision Support Systems, which are typically thought of as being used in a business environment. And certainly there are environmental decision support systems and spatial decision support systems, but we're really moving towards the application of um, decision support in uh, more wicked and complex uh, problems. And so uh, decision support uh, is needed now more than ever because we're making decisions today um, that are taking place in unprecedented conditions. Uh, we're looking at uh, complexity and uncertainty um, that we've not seen before and trying to adapt so that we can combine our knowledge together in ways that will help us to move forward towards action that can modify and assist society as, as we are transitioning into new equilibria um, points and new ways of being. And that requires new ways of knowing. Um, so decision support systems are a combination of, I think of them as a combination of social processes and uh, computational tools that help us and aid us in analyzing and making sense of challenges um, and helping us to identify possible solutions or actions that we can move forward. So that's the DSS in the title. The wicked part of it is the kinds of problems. So wicked problems are um, complex, ill-structured, uh, dynamic, ambiguous, uncertain. There's rarely a clear solution um, and there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, they can't really be studied easily through a trial and error approach um, because they're, they're very complex and they're in the real world. Um, and there's no clear and definitive formulation for how we actually define that problem. So our problem framing shifts depending on who you're speaking to, which I think is one of the most important aspects that we need to think about as scientists and as researchers in this arena. Um, and most of all, then, we're out in that wild world. I've been seeing people in text mes messages and on social media using IRL, in the real world and in real life. Uh, where do we see it happening? All of these problems are out there. We're facing hazards like we've never seen before, such as the pandem pandemics, but also hurricanes, flooding, fires. Um, there are a multitude of things, and scientists have to transition as we are transitioning in the world around us. So I want to use a problem and pick a problem uh, that's a wicked problem that's fast enough for us to actually start to um, move forward in learning how to adapt and use decision support, build decision support systems and, and tools um, for those problems. And I've been really fortunate because the University of Texas at Austin launched a program called Planet Texas 2050. And in fact, Michael Young, who spoke before me, um, actually is a member of this team that's working to find ways to actually address some of the problems that are, are being faced in Texas in particular. So one of the motivating forces is that today's population um, is going to double by 2050. And so that means that while we're, um, Currently, at much lower numbers, we, we're going to be um, moving forward so that we've got communities and um, uh, societal institutions that are going to have to scale up rapidly. And climate change will be one of the driving forces um, that's going to move that forward. Our goal as um, a project and as a program is to work across the university campus and outside and beyond the university walls to actually take 
uh, theory and knowledge across all of the disciplines, combine that, and then find ways that we can apply it to help make Texas more resilient. And that's our grand challenge. Um, I'm based at Texas Advanced Computing Center. We are one of the um, nation's high-performance uh, high computing centers. Um, but beyond the high-performance computing services that we um, provide, and, and luckily, luckily for us, um, there's been massive investment in the cyber ecosystem and the high-performance computing infrastructure for the nation. But beyond just the high-performance computing systems, um, it's people, it's systems and services, and also assuring that we've got the capacity to actually conduct and, and complete modeling at large scale. But that includes data storage and visualization, networks, cloud computing, code optimization. All of these different ways that computing services can support us, they, they can help us if we leverage them properly to make sense of these very complex IRL in the real life problems. Um, and we can accelerate our um, ways of analyzing them, and more importantly, we can accelerate our social learning about them uh, if, we, if we're able to combine all of these different uh, advanced computing techniques. In Planet Texas, we're actually building a process, a, a cyber ecosystem that sits on top of all of the high-performance uh, computing services, and it ranges from adaptive sensing that allows you to data stream in. We're leveraging EarthCube um, data streaming services for that. The Cords, for those of you who may be familiar with it, is now being integrated into the, the Science Gateway portals. And uh, we've got a Science Gateway or a data portal called Data X for Planet Texas. Data X then can feed into a model integration platform that sits on top of everything else. And that model integration platform that we're currently working with is still in development, but it's called Mint for model integration, not surprisingly. And then we're thinking about if, if you're generating data and outputs that are very large, um, it's important to maintain those. There's a cost and uh, it's a resource that we want to have available in the future. And we're not terribly skilled right now at assuring that large data sets are archived and preserved for future generations. And so we've got another part of this program called digital, uh, it's called SOLCHE, which stands for the Digital Object Lifecycle. And that actually is looking at how we take the outputs and results of a complex modeling um, analysis and we push them into a library system so that they can be available and curated and maintained for future future researchers and for, for future use. And then ultimately, the goal is to get things to the people that need to use them. In fact, one of my primary goals as, throughout my career is to make these systems more participatory and accessible across stakeholder groups um, that include subject matter experts, but also includes people who are just coming with a lived experience that's important for a particular problem that's being addressed and solved. And those participatory interfaces, to me, are one of the the end goal is to remove the experts from the loop so the experts aren't controlling the dialogue, um, but enabling people to have these important discussions around what's the meaning of the data, the meaning of the models, and how do we actually um, allow them to have the dialogues and deliberation that they need to have to make the, the decisions um, that are informed by the work that all of us here do. Um, so today, I really want to think about what are those building blocks? And, and what's the basic unit of knowledge? And really, our units of knowledge are built on data and models. And so much of the effort for this Planet Te Texas effort, and I know that many other systems are, are working and teams are working towards similar goals, but much of our system is focused on the data with the data portals and the model integration platform. So I wanted to speak quickly to those. Basically, we're trying to build a better DSS and enable people to make, put their combinations of information and models together faster and more efficiently. And we do part of that through Science Gateway data portals. These are similar to things that you see like Quasi and HydroShare um, as an example, or Ikevai from Hawaii is another example. Um, I know that there are many, many examples that different groups are putting together, but the beauty of this is we're creating mechanisms to actually come in and put our data into uh, shared spaces that we can access them easily afterwards. And in the interest of time, I've got small videos for all of these, but I'm gonna try to get to the um, end point because I wanna make sure we really speak to, to some of the important end parts of this pipeline. 
Um, once you get your data loaded into a shared space, then you can make it accessible to the models. And an important thing there is making those models accessible and connected back to the data. And I know that CSDMS and, and folks that are involved in your um, society and community have looked at things like BMI. Um, we've been using the um, geoscientific standard names as one of the devices for linking between the data that lives in a portal and the input parameters or output uh, results and responses that a model actually um, either is looking for or needs for um, to be instantiated or the response metrics that we want to look at after we've run different models. And it helps with the connectivity across um, the modeling platforms and services. Um, we're trying to use artificial intelligence to accelerate that process, which of course means um, lots of semantics, um, many different ways of, of looking at and um, categorizing and labeling the data and information and the models themselves. We, one of the most important, I think, innovations that all of us need to push to, to really drive forward is how to create model catalogs that are um, intuitive and accessible, easy for modelers to actually package and, and place their models into these systems and make them runnable. And, and you know, currently, of course, uh, we, can, we can package them up, we can place them in virtual machines, um, we can dockerize them um, and use singularity in other ways. But I, I hope that in the coming years, we're going to see that it becomes easier and easier and that the reach between a computer scientist and a technical or, or subject matter expert modeler becomes easier and easier to get to. In the case of model integration, we're using this Mint platform. We're able to actually load data from anywhere on Earth. Um, we've been using uh, the hand model, so height above natural drainage is just a good example base model. Um, we set it up so that you can automate um, the uh, selection of a basin or an area anywhere on Earth, uh, clip the DEM, um, 10 meter DEM is what we're using right now, but we've started working with uh, Paula Pasalacqua and her team to try and move towards LiDAR data that's one meter in resolution um, and run a hand model just out of the box. So from zero to an actual product that's visualized and interactive, um, I was able to do it quickly in under 10 minutes for a small basin um, near the city of Austin that's important in our urban environment. And what's important about this is it took me two and a half years. Um, well, it actually took me four years and 40 people and $2.5 million um, that I raised to complete my doctoral work. And my doctoral work was building the decision support system for one groundwater system in Texas. Um, to be able to actually develop and run groundwater models, which we can do, or um, flood models or flood representations um, in just a matter of minutes is really transformative because it means that we're going to be able to now start to move toward how do we use those models. Um, this is one example of data fusion where we took the flood models and the hand maps and combined it then with infrastructure and um, you know the building maps for the city of Austin and completed um, vulnerability mapping also within just a matter of minutes. Um, I'll point you quickly, there's, last August was the first time that we were actually able to run everything from beginning to end um, from a data stream. So this is uh, at the Intelligent Systems and Geosciences uh, Research Coordination Network that we had last year. We actually hosted it in Boulder. And this is in fact uh, looking at Boulder Canyon. We took sensors, um, we deployed them. Of course, we deployed them locally so that we could just put them in and give them the signal that they were wet or not wet. But we ran this uh, from the sensor that we set up using cords into the portal, from the portal into a model, and from the model out into an augmented reality sandbox. And it was the first time that we were able to do that. Um, and we did it in just a matter of, um, you know, in that case, it took us a couple of days, but now we could actually do it uh, literally in minutes. So finally, what I want to talk about, and I just have a few more minutes, but I want to just speak about what really matters in real life and when we start to use our models in real life is that the limitations may not be computational. The limita limitations may be more at the level of the speed of trust. And that speed of trust comes to us through our human interactions and our human acceptance of the credibility and trustworthiness of the information that's being put in front of us. And as modelers, I think it's really important for all of us to, to think carefully about what our role is 
And I also think that it's very important for us to start to be explicit about where we are in the phases of our model action, particularly when you see um, responses to things like this pandemic or other um, hurricane events, for example. And we need to start to understand what our role is, how our models are being used, how we put the bumper rails on them. The picture that you see here uh, is of Hornsby Bend, which is actually a sewage treatment um, facility. And they are building trust with the community constantly. They've turned it into um, both a treatment facility, but it's also a place where birders come regularly. And they host educational events that are very um, diverse and hopefully inclusive as well. And it's building those relationships prior to an event that are going to help us to become more prepared. Being prepared includes thinking about how our models are, are added into catalogs so that they can be rapidly, rapidly ingested into a decision support process. And what I've observed as I've watched multiple teams um, from epidemiology and now um, as we're starting to use uh, wastewater treat, uh, wastewater itself as one of the um, indicators, data indicators for where clusters of um, pandemic spread may be. Um, I'm watching and, and seeing that some of the things that come up are uh, researchers need to think about scale first before they complete an analysis and present it. They need to think about how that necessary knowledge can be scaled across because if you're able to complete a, a model like an epidemiology model or a flood model, uh, you've got to think about how you make sure um, as a researcher that you can complete it quickly and uh, leverage the advanced computing. Uh, you've got to make sure that your expertise is properly included and that it's trustworthy information that you're, you're sharing. Um, and you need to be flexible and accessible in terms of being able to share it with other researchers in your field. And you also have to be very aware and able to communicate the uncertainty. And it also needs to be um, recognized that the work that you're doing may not be timely. It may be that you're working on a research code that needs to be looking out 15 years. And if you're in a code base and an advancement of knowledge that's not ready for real time in real life, then it's time to hold that back and, and make sure that you continue to develop it, even as we try to support the ongoing efforts um, with our knowledge. In real life, over in the other column, I want to make sure that I just emphasize quickly, and I've gone over a bit, but um, in real life, people need to know what are candidate solutions that are good enough to support insightful dialogue. They don't have to be perfect, and we can assume that the, the people that we're talking to will understand that our models aren't perfect, and we need to be able to communicate that with them. And we need to be ready for that as modelers. We need to make an option, a, a choice. Am I working on the research side during a pandemic or during a, a critical event, or am I working in real life with the people that need to apply the knowledge somewhere? And we need to realize too that the framing of that problem is not our scientific framing of the problem. We've got to connect the problem frame to the actual decision support issue. I'm going to stop here because I've run over and my apologies for that. But in real life, um, knowledge is being integrated in application and um, we've got to commit ourselves to the pace that, that society needs us to, to interact with them on. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. This is a, a fascinating topic. And I think it's sort of this frontier of like bringing the modeling to um, like more applications and in, a, in an interdisciplinary way. We'll, we'll have time for like one or two questions in the chat and then maybe like just a few short ones. Okay. I'm sorry I ran over a bit. That's all right. We, we, did, we never said like any times for anything. So we have like a little bit of like <laughs> buzz factor there. Um, so Claire is asking, how integrated are you with your library and information science and social sciences departments at UT? I'm in a graduate, graduate program designed to train for these wicked problems and eff effective decision support. I've identified so much with the things you have mentioned through the talk, but I wanted to hear more about how you work, um, or how you're working to make this data more policymaker applicable. Hmm. Well, uh, there wasn't time to show you, but in that model integration platform, um, I'm spending most of my time thinking about how to design the, the process that leads um, a user through setting up their model and ingesting their data and registering it. 
at the time that they start to register and ingest a model, they actually have to um, categorize and, and register what are the aspects of their problems that are decision relevant. So what are the potential performance measures um, that they may use out of their model or what data may be used to combine to construct an indicator. They also have to identify what are the decision variables of their problem up front. They have to also identify which parameters or variables may be um, optional um, uh, optimization or objective functions used, used for objective functions. So we're building into the structure of the platform upfront um, identification of the problem frames. Um, I think it's the social process though. I believe that we need um, model-based facilitators. We need facilitators that are specially trained not to mediate or negotiate, but to actually facilitate the knowledge through modeling. And so I think the social process and understanding that there are many problem structuring methodologies that are already well understood and well used, we've just got to now couple those with our um, models and data themselves. And regarding the library and connecting with the library systems, currently we've got it set up so there's an API um, that when you, we, we track the provenance through all of the model runs using principally Pegasus right now on our systems, but it's all connected into that model platform so you can go back and find things. The interface needs to be improved and we're going to have lots many years of fun fixing that right and making it easier to use but uh, the api uh, goes straight from the hpc systems into the library and we're, we're working with them on um, how do we maintain large data sets inside uh, spaces like the texas digital repository which is part of the texas library system um, in terms of all of the other disciplines um, so I use human organizational systems research in my own work. Um, Michael and I come to, I come to the Planet Texas program as a computing scientist, although I'm trained in hydrogeology and I worked in industry for many years in environmental management. Michael also comes at it from a scientific perspective, but we have um, a faculty members from humanities. We've got um, social scientists and we've also got even English professors who sit on our organizing committee. And so we're, we're really wrestling with how do you find shared language and how do you understand different epistemological um, stances and uh, lenses of change. Thank you. I'd um, be happy to talk more about that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, I mean, you may want to chat separately. The, the chat window, there's like a bunch of compliments, which is always good. It's building with compliments. But there's also this interesting point by Danica, who brings up this um, the question about how do you reconcile academic publishing timelines with like rapid response to decision makers? And um, how do you make data available before it's already been peer reviewed? Is her question. So I think you're right at the crux of it. I'm so excited. Yeah, honestly, this is what I'm looking at. I've been observing five teams going through the pandemic. It turns out we're in a unique position. Usually these interactions happen in real life. Um, um, it, I'm, so personally, I'm sad that we have to do everything on Zoom. But from an intellectual perspective, we're in this unprecedented opportunity. And, and as hurricane season is approaching and other events are going to happen over the year, we have a rare opportunity to watch how teams are interacting to share knowledge and information. We don't do it well. And um, I've observed some people get out a bit too early and they find themselves uh, trying to conduct their research as a fire drill as they try to respond to the request for knowledge and information. And that's one of the key things I'm trying to understand is how do we help train scientists to realize when they can transition to a decision support role? Because I think that's, I think it's uncertain and we need to learn more how to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for